Lyrics by Fanny Jane Crosby 1820 Music by William Howard Doan 1832 To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son who yielded his life our redemption to win, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes? That moment from Jesus a pardon receives? Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer, and higher, and greater will be. Our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Hi, welcome back to Waiting in Laodicea. I'm your host, A.T. Martinez, and as you notice, we started today's service off a little bit different. We started off with the recitation of the lyrics to the song. Many of you may recognize this song as a hymn out of, out of many hymnals, and it's a very old hymn, having been written in the 1800s, but the idea behind the hymn actually starts a lot sooner than that. The idea of giving God the glory starts, well, starts in the Old Testament. We, But for our sake, it continues as the fifth of the final sola. Now, when Mark, again, going back, just to, for those that don't know what, what I'm talking about, who are just tuning in, when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, which was not his intent, he was trying to reform the church. It's called the Protestant Reformation because the church did exactly take to the reform. The church he was trying to reform was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church had a lot of things going wrong at the time. I mean, they were selling indulgences and forgiveness and basically messing up what God had said to do, at least from what Martin Luther could see. Now, Martin Luther went through and he read the Bible, something that he was able to do then because he read and spoke Latin. Now, back then, keep in mind, the Bible was not written in English. It wasn't written in any language but Latin. So the only people that could actually read the Bible were the priests. And Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, and he read the Bible and he said, wait a minute, this is what I'm reading here is not what is happening in the church. And he published a listing of five solas. The fifth sola is, so, is okay, let me see if I'm going to try to say this right. I'm not very good with Latin. The fifth sola says, Soli Dio dia Gloria, which for those who speak Latin, understand what it means, but I'm going to break it down for you. Soli meaning only Dio, God, Gloria, glory, only glorify God, or glory to God alone. Now this being the fifth one, and the fourth one, if you remember, only through Sola Christos, really work hand in hand, and they tie together all the other ideas. Because if you know only Christ can get you into heaven, then all glory belongs automatically to God for sending Christ. As the song says, that he so loved us that he sent his son. Now that's a direct, okay, artistic use of John 3.16. And for those of you who don't know what John 3.16 says, let's take a look at it. Because it does relate. There we go, John. Now, John, for those of you who don't want a little history while I'm looking this up, 
John was, John tends to write the most love-based, the most emotion-based of the Gospels. He called himself the Beloved because in his mind, or at least from what we can see, John was one of the most beloved of the disciples. So let's see what John 3.16 says for those of you that don't know it. Everybody else, go ahead and just recite it with me. I know you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we automatically see right there, as the song said and as the Bible says, God loved us so much that he gave us Christ. And that right there makes him the most qualified for glory. He's the only one that should be glorified. Now, what do we see in the in the Catholic Church back then, today, and not only the Catholic Church, but many churches? What do we see? What we see is a lot of people getting glory and pr having their prestige increased, but not God. We see people trying to take the glory for themselves. But the reality is only God deserves the glory. Now, giving glory to God is something that is covered many times in the Bible. The Old Testament, the whole point of the Old Testament was for the, for the, for the Israelis, the Israelites, to give God the glory and to love their God as, with all their heart, mind, and soul. This is so prevalent of a thought that whenever Christ was asked by the crowds, I mean, look at Matthew 26. I'm going to go ahead and have it read to you just to make things easier. And when we get back, we'll cover it. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Reading from the New King James Version. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what we see is the most important commandment is to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So therefore, again, if you love him with all of what you are, then he gets the glory. This is reminiscent of, you know, the first and second of the Ten Commandments. Love your God. No other God. Now, why does God get the glory? Well, let me ask you three questions. And if you can give me any other answer but him to these three questions, then maybe somebody else deserves the glory. But you can't. I know, they're trick questions. First question, who made the universe? Well, as a Christian, we know who made the universe. God did. He says it in Genesis chapter 1, and poof, the universe existed. Now, if you're an atheist, you're trying to say nobody made the universe, so therefore nobody deserves the glory. Now, next question. Who knew you when you were still in the womb? Think about it. None of, not your mother and father, they knew of you. Nobody knew you from before you even existed. Other than God. Sorry about that, folks. I had to get my glasses ready. Now, God knew us and formed us in the womb. We learned this. There are many verses in the Old Testament that talk about this. One of them, Isaiah 44, verse 24, says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself.
He knew you, made you in the beginning. He's known you your whole life. Not only has he known you your whole life, but then he goes one step further. He offers you salvation. Now, if you look at your life in all honesty, do you deserve to be saved? No. None of us do. So therefore, that leaves us to our last question. Who else can save you? Nobody else can save you. I know it, you know it. The only one who can save you, as we covered in our last sola, is Christ. The only one that can save, the only way you can be saved is through Christ. Therefore, the only, uh, only God that can, you know, only one worthy of glory is God. God sent Christ. And as Christ is God, God gets the glory. So, how important is this? Well, I'm going to go ahead and play for you another set of verses for you. And this comes from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 21 through 40. And I'll be right after that. 1 Kings 17, 21 to 40. Reading from the New American Bible, Revised Edition. Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you straddle the issue? If the Lord is God, follow him, if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him. So Elijah said to the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Give us two young bulls. Let them choose one, cut it into pieces, and place it on the wood, but start no fire. I shall prepare the other and place it on the wood, but shall start no fire. You shall call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. The God who answers with fire is God. All the people answered, We agree. Elijah then said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one young bull and prepare it first, for there are more of you. Call upon your gods, but do not start the fire. Taking the young bull that was turned over to them, they prepared it and called upon Baal from morning to noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound, and no one answering. And they hopped around the altar they had prepared. When it was noon, Elijah taunted them, Call louder, for he is a god, he may be busy doing his business, or may be on a journey. Perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. They called out louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears according to their ritual until blood gushed over them. Noon passed and they remained in a prophetic state until the time for offering sacrifice. But there was no sound, no one answering, no one listening. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. When they drew near to him, he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been destroyed. He took twelve stones, for the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord had said, Israel shall be your name. He built the stones into an altar to the name of the Lord, and made a trench around the altar large enough for two measures of grain. When he had arranged the wood, he cut up the young bull and laid it on the wood. He said, Fill four jars with water and pour it over the burnt offering and over the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he said, and they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, even the trench was filled with the water. At the time for offering sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came forward and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me, that this people may know that you, Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. The Lord's fire came down and devoured the burnt offering, wood, stones, and dust, and lapped up the water in the trench. Seeing this, all the people fell prostrate and said, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. 
let none of them escape. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the Wadi Kishon and there he slaughtered them. Now I will tell you this is one of my favorite, favorite sections in the Bible. And this shows you real quickly why it is God alone gets the glory. Because what you have here is a bunch of the Israeli Israelites who are confused on whether they should worship Baal or they should worship God. And Elijah basically says, that's it, let's put this to a test. You take your X number of priests of Baal, even have them show up, and we'll do a we'll do a pray off. And I, I, this kind of reminds me of the scene in Guardians of the Galaxy, the very first one, where they decide to have a dance off. Well, Elijah decides he's going to have a pray off. He gets them out there, get they set up their altar, and they're praying and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're cutting themselves up. And what is Elijah's answer to this? Hey, pray louder. They could be asleep. You know, maybe they're on vacation. Maybe you ought to call back later. He just ridicules them because there's nothing that they're praying to. When it comes to the idea of gods, there is only one God. And that is the God of, God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's it. Now, it's an interesting thing. I remember whenever I was back in college, I had a math, math teacher who, who was Jewish who explained to me that we as humans like to give things names. By naming things, we tend to codify and limit them. Yet, what is the name of God? Now, when we look in the Jewish religion, which he was Jewish, we find the name of God is, let's see, yeah, what, we, what we have translated to mean Yahweh. But the problem is, there's no vowels in it. The Jewish terms is, let me, let's look that up real fast. Okay, so we have four letters, Y-H-W-H that are used to represent God in the Jewish religion, to represent the name of God. Now, there are other terms for God in the, New, in the Old Testament. Adonai, El. Um, El. I mean, innumerable words that are used to glorify God. El Shaddai. All of these things are words for God, but they're not the name of God. When it comes to the name of God, like your name is, like my assistant's name is Alexander, my name is A.T., the name in the Jewish religion for God is Y. Y H W H. That's not a word. It's, and by the way, they're all four, all four are capitalized. And the reason is because the Jews recognized they could not limit God. When we give something a name, we specify, we separate it, and we reduce it to a certain limitations. By naming it alone, we make it limited. For example, if I mention, you know, if I say my son's full name, that's one person, and they're most likely the only person in the world with that name. Now, I know my daughter's probably got the only one in the world that has her name because I invented her middle name. The point is we've separated it from the crowd, but we also limit it. Yahweh, as we use it, which is a German, German basically some Germans trying to pronounce it, the unpronounceable, they came up with and added the vowels to make a word. Yahweh is an attempt to vocalize that which cannot be vocalized. Because it cannot be limited. And if he can't be limited, 
then he alone deserves the glory. Everything else has limits, but God does not. Now, so you had the priests of Baal doing their best to get the attention. And they're yelling, they're screaming, they're acting like idiots. And guess what? Their non-existent God didn't answer. All the Old Testament gods that are mentioned of the other people, none of their gods responded. And that's one of the problems with paganism and all these other religions out there. Do their gods respond? Now, Elijah, when they were finished, he decided to add insult to injury. He took and had buckets of, of water poured all over the offering, all over the altar, and filled a trench around the sides. That's how much water was in there. Now, if you've ever been camping, trying to light soaking wet wood on fire is impossible. And you know this. So what do you think normally would have happened? Normally, because he showed off and put water all over everything, he should have got nothing. But yet he didn't use, he didn't light his offering. God lit it. And he lit it so much that the fire burnt down everything. Soaked up, burned off all the water in the trench. Took the ram, took it all. Why? Because God deserves the glory. And when it comes to, sh to earning our glory, only God does. Now, you know, there's a lot of people out there that do good things. There are many times in my life that my pride for my kids is immense. That they will do amazing and wonderful things. My hopes for my kids are even more immense. That one day they will outshine everything. But they don't deserve the glory. Only God does. My favorite actor of all times. I love his shows. It was Earl Flynn. After Earl Flynn, you have several other great actors that I enjoy. Do they deserve the glory? No. They're just actors. Playing parts. My favorite musician. He's dead. No longer can even hear the glory. Everywhere you look, anybody who's your favorite, I've got a lot of favorites. Favorite author, favorite musician, favorite singer, favorite, favorite actor, favorite politician, favorite philosopher. Do any of these deserve the glory? No. They can't save me. They didn't create the universe, and they haven't known me since before I was even born. Now, when you get an answer to those three questions, and it's only one person, one being, then that's the only one that deserves the glory. Now, what do we have instead is we have a lot of people that are trying to take the glory. We have a lot of evangelists or some supposed evangelists and preachers who stand up in front of their congregations and put on a show and mesmerize their audience so the audience is, will end up even chanting their names. Well, guess what? You didn't just, you're, you're stealing somebody else's glory. If you're a preacher and you're trying to make it about you, then you miss the point. Because you don't deserve any of the glory. None of us do. All you are is a spokesperson for the person who actually deserves the glory. Now, we all know who politicians think deserve the glory, and that's themselves. Even to the point when they will lie about what they've done to get that glory. We see it all the time. We saw it with Trump. We see it with Biden. We saw it with Obama. Every single politician is out there taking credit for things they had no part in. Some more blatantly than others. 
I mean, I remember this last week, and it's about a week, week and a half ago. President Biden came out and did a press conference where he was talking about the situation in the Middle East. A situation where he basically didn't do anything constructive. And the fact that they were going to a ceasefire, he tried to take credit for it. When the reality is, it was Egypt who brokered a, pe a ceasefire. Biden, who couldn't even say that Israel deserves the right to defend themselves, no, I take that back. I believe he did finally say that. But he wouldn't condemn those that didn't, didn't agree with it. He wouldn't condemn his own party members that felt it was wrong for Israel to exist or to even try to defend themselves against Hamas's rockets. And he wants credit. Too often we have a world filled with people trying to get the credit, get the glory, and they don't deserve it. What'd they do? The answer is they didn't do anything. They didn't create the universe. They haven't known you your whole life. And even knowing you your whole life offered you a chance at salvation, which they provided. Bottom line, only God deserves the glory. And that is why it's the fifth sola. We need to remember as we go out throughout our days and our nights, everything that we do should be done to give God the glory. At no point should we be trying to take the glory because did you know me in the womb? The answer obviously is no. Most of you didn't know me even before I started this series. So, as you are going through your day, remember, only God deserves the glory. And that's why, as the final sola, it ties everything together. Because once you have your Bible, and you read your Bible, and you see the amazing, wonderful things God has done that we don't deserve, and never can pay for, and never will earn, and you see the fact that you get to talk to God. That all you have to do is ha have, accept the grace you were given, have faith in Christ, trust Christ, and follow Christ, and give God the glory. Yeah, I know it sounds it's like this and this and this and this, but the thing is it's all wrapped together. Because as you live your life following Christ, you will give God the glory. As you live your life following Christ, if you read the New Testament, that's how you find out how to follow Christ. Reading your Bible teaches you why God gets the glory and how to follow Christ. And it's all easy. Just follow what it says. And when you mess up, ask for forgiveness and keep on giving God the glory. That concludes this big series on the five solos. Next week, we'll have a new series. Next week, we'll have different versions, different topics. I hope you will enjoy each and every one of the topics as they come up. If you have questions or comments that you'd like to send me, you may do so in the comment section below. Please comment. I welcome comments. Or if this it's a little more personal, then you can. Included in the description of this episode is our email address. Email us. You can email it for questions, for comments, just to have a conversation. If you're lonely and you're looking for someone to talk to, email me. I'm here. If you enjoyed this show, hit the like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification button and share this episode. Remember, by hitting the subscribe button and the like button, you actually help support this ministry. And the more people do it, the sooner that we'll hit a thousand. Once we hit a thousand, we can do live shows and we actually get monetized, meaning that we'll actually start making some income. May not be a lot. It doesn't have to be a lot. God will provide what we need. 
Now, if God is telling you to donate to us and you want to know how to do that, <coughs> excuse me, you can donate through this channel. You can click at the, at the top of the thing where it says donate to or whatever, however it says it. You can look in the descriptions and see several other ways to donate. You can look in the description for the channel and see the fact you could become a patron. Find the method that agrees with you most. If none of these jump out at you and you want to try to find another way, maybe you just want to send a check. Well, that's fine. All you got to do then is email me and I'll send you the address to do so. I will work with you regardless of what you try to donate because that's what we're here for. I want to thank you all for being with us and I pray God is with you every day and will remind you that he deserves the glory. Thank you. Thank you.